This video is brought to you by Brilliant. Sudan has been embroiled in a full-scale civil war for nearly a year now, as two rival generals engage in a power struggle that has plunged the country into a devastating humanitarian crisis. So far, the powerful Paramilitary Rapid Support Forces, or RSF, have been on the front foot, and the group's leader has been seeking to complement those battlefield successes with international legitimacy. So in this video, we're going to explain what's happened so far, explore the current state of the conflict, including the RSF's battlefield successes, international involvement in the conflict, and the challenges facing peace efforts. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. So let's start with some background. Back in 1989, a military coup brought the military officer Omar al-Bashir to power. Eventually, after a 30-year dictatorship, Bashir was ousted amid the Sudanese revolution, sparking hopes that the country would move towards civilian rule. Sudan did indeed begin a transition towards democracy, with a joint civilian military council leading the way. However, this process was appended in October 2021, when the Sudanese military under General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan dissolved the government and seized power. The military carried out this coup alongside the RSF, led by Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo, better known as Hemeti. The RSF emerged from the Janjaweed, a predominantly Arab militia that, in the 2000s, were used by then-President Bashir to brutally suppress a rebellion by largely non-Arab groups in the Darfur region. The atrocities carried out by the Janjaweed and the Sudanese military were declared by the US to be genocide, and numerous arrest warrants were issued by the International Criminal Court for genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Anyway, after being officially founded in 2013, the RSF grew into a key component of Sudan's security apparatus. Anyway, let's return to the wake of the October 2021 coup, and Army Chief Bahan is in charge, while RSF leader Hameti is his deputy. Tensions grew between the two organisations, and one of the final straws precipitating the conflict was a dispute over plans to integrate the RSF into the regular armed forces. Eventually, on April 15, 2023, fighting erupted between the RSF and the Sudanese military, beginning the civil war that persists to this day, nearly a year later. The consequences of the war have been devastating, with the UN's humanitarian chief describing it as one of the worst humanitarian nightmares in recent history. As of February, around 8.1 million people have been displaced, roughly 6.3 million people within Sudan and about 1.8 million people who have fled the country. Nearly 14,000 people have been killed since fighting broke out, according to ACLED. However, they say that this is likely a significant underestimate of the conflict's human toll. On top of this, the war risks triggering the world's largest hunger crisis, according to the World Food Programme, which says 25 million people are trapped in a spiral of deteriorating food security across Sudan, plus South Sudan and Chad, which host a lot of Sudanese refugees. So what is the battlefield situation? Well, to sum things up, the RSF is basically on the front foot. Fighting initially erupted in the capital Khartoum tri-city area, but spread across the country, particularly to the Darfur region, where four of the five local capitals fell to the RSF in 2023. Towards the end of the year, the RSF captured Wad Madani, the capital of Jazeera State, an agricultural region known as something of a breadbasket for Sudan. Khartoum remains contested, though is mostly controlled by the RSF, something that last year forced General Burhan to relocate his headquarters to the coastal city of Port Sudan. Tragically, it's civilians that have bore the brunt of the violence. In Darfur, there have been documented atrocities by the RSF and its allies against the area's non-Arab population, with the UN warning of a repeat of the horrors of the early 2000s. While the RSF has had the most battlefield success, the Sudanese armed forces have retained air superiority, but have been accused of using this to carry out indiscriminate airstrikes, which have come at huge civilian cost. Mediation efforts, largely led by the US and Saudi Arabia, and the regional IGAD bloc have failed to bring about a lasting ceasefire, and hopes for a Ramadan ceasefire, something demanded by the UN Security Council, appear to have been dashed. Amid all this, Hameti has been seeking to burnish his legitimacy both inside Sudan and further afield, presenting himself as a statesman that other leaders can do business with, 
and someone who is essential to any kind of settlement in Sudan. From late December through January, Hameti went on something of an international charm offensive, touring capitals and meeting with leaders and or vice leaders of South Africa, Uganda, Djibouti, Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda and South Sudan. But perhaps most important was his meeting with former Sudanese Prime Minister Abdallah Hamdok in Ethiopia. Hamdok was Prime Minister post the 2019 revolution, but was ousted by Burhan and Hemeti in the 2021 coup. He remains one of the country's most prominent civilian politicians and now leads the Takadum Civilian Coalition. Hamdok and Hemeti signed a declaration intended to serve as the basis for future negotiations and an eventual political settlement. Hamdok has also requested to meet with the military's general Burhan, though whether this ever happens remains to be seen. Hameti and the RSF has also benefited from control of much of Sudan's gold trade, plus other natural resources that have helped boost the paramilitary's income, allowing it to acquire weapons, pay salaries, fund media campaigns, lobbying, and buy support of other political and armed groups. As for its supply of weapons, there is credible evidence, according to the UN, that the United Arab Emirates is providing the RSF with weaponry and ammunition, with shipments entering Sudan via neighbouring Chad, though the UAE denies this. The UAE's support is important for more than just the physical things it supplies. It's been theorised that the backing from the UAE, which is increasingly active on the African continent, has helped Hermeti with his recent diplomatic forays and meeting with Sudan's civilian opposition. The conflict, therefore, has taken on an international dimension. As the World Peace Foundation's director said, Sudan has become a cockpit in which the rising powers of the Middle East seek to gain advantage over their rivals. You've got the UAE on the RSF side, while Egypt has close ties with Burhan and the armed forces, who are also allegedly being supported by Iran. The conflict risks destabilising the wider region, not least neighbouring Chad, which is something we recently made a video about. Another interesting subplot is the involvement of Russian Wagner mercenaries allegedly in support of the RSF, and the reported presence of Ukrainian special forces in Sudan targeting said mercenaries. Anyway, if a negotiated peaceful settlement is to be reached, then it can surely only be reached with a significant coordinated diplomatic push, with all sides and every actor being at the table. But both generals still seem to see the war as one they can win, and one that is a fight to the bitter end. In this case, military victory for either side will likely come at a terrible human price. A lot of stuff that we talk about at TLDR News can seem pretty complicated, especially when we dive into economics and detailed data, which is why we use Brilliant.org to keep us sharp. Brilliant is where you learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in maths, data analysis, programming, and AI. Brilliant is a learning platform designed to be uniquely effective. Their first principles approach helps you build understanding from the ground up, which is also how we structure TLDR videos. Each lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving that lets you play with concepts, a method proven to be six times more effective than just watching lectures. Plus, all content on Brilliant is crafted by an award-winning team of teachers, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Caltech, Duke, Microsoft, Google, and more. Brilliant helps build your critical thinking skills through problem solving, not memorizing. So, while you're building real knowledge on specific topics, you'll also be becoming a better thinker. Learning a little every day is one of the most important things you can do, both for your personal and professional growth. Brilliant helps you build real knowledge in minutes a day, with fun lessons you can do whenever you have time. It's the opposite of mindless scrolling. Brilliant recently launched a ton of new content in data, all of which uses real-world data to train you to see trends and make better informed decisions, something politicians could really learn from. Anyway, these are for learners of any level to start or continue learning data analysis, with a fully built-out suite of new content, from Bayes' theorem to multiple linear regression. And you can truly learn by doing, as you'll be working with real datasets from sources like Starbucks, Twitter, Spotify, and more. To try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, click on the link in the description. You also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks for watching, and thanks to Brilliant for their support of TLDR News.